should be going. It's very, I don't know what's happening either. Why is it doing that? streams on our website and then YouTube live. Oh, it's on the Yeah. <coughs> I think it's this, uh, the widgets. power cycle the whole thing. Good morning, and, <laughs> and welcome to those of you joining us virtually and those of you present here at All Souls Unitarian Church of Indianapolis. My name is Emma, worship associate. If you are visiting us this morning, we are glad that you are here with us. We welcome you and we invite you to bring your whole self as you join us in worship today. In a few, moment, in a few moments, we will open our service with the reading of the covenant and chalice lighting. These rituals <laughs> remind us to continually renew our promise to live into the covenant, to put love into action, and to live out the community of love, just and justice that we aim to be. <coughs> our topic this morning continues the conversation from last Sunday when we were invited into awareness and gratitude for what farm workers as essential workers do. This morning we bring it home to our congregation and we'll speak about deepening our welcome of our children, families, and, East, and staff of the East Coast Migrant Head Start Project's Indianapolis campus. We welcome the campus director, Ms. Patricia Patti Licea, who is with us this morning. And again, welcome, let us worship together. Uh, before we go on with our further announcements, we do have one quick special announcement, and so I'd like to ask Ms. Annie Ray Hill, Chair of our Ministerial Search Committee, to come up and make a quick announcement for you all. Good morning. Good morning. It was an exciting week on the Ministerial Search Committee. Since the beginning of January, we've been in the second phase of our search, the discernment phase. This phase is shrouded in secrecy as we read about, talked to, and then eventually met prospective ministers. I'm excited to tell you that the discernment phase is over. 
and we have our candidate. Someone in the UUA Transitions Office at the beginning of our discernment phase said to us that what often happens is that ministerial search committees fall in love with one candidate and that candidate falls in love with the congregation right back. And that's what happened to us. Though I'm itching to give you details of the amazing candidate that we found, we still have a few hoops, logistical hoops, to jump through in the next few days. But I will be back next Sunday with other members of the Ministerial Search Committee to reveal to you who our candidate is. So we are now entering phase three of the search, which is all about you. The third phase culminates in Candidating Week. And I wanted to give you the dates of Candidating Week. So what happens in Candidating Week um, is that the candidate will be here on Sunday, May 8th, which is Mother's Day. So we're hoping you can postpone your Mother's Day celebrations until after you come to church to meet the candidate. She will, they will be here in the pulpit. And um, then, they will be here for the remainder of that week with many, many, many opportunities for you to meet with them. The Ministerial Search Committee and the board are going to spend the next five weeks creating many, many opportunities. The hope is that every one of you will sign up to do one of the things over that week to meet in person with this candidate. And then following Sunday, May 15th, the candidate will again be in the pulpit, and after that we will have a meeting, a congregational meeting, where we will have a vote on whether or not to call this candidate as our next settled minister. So the first step is next Sunday, same time, same place. We will reveal to you who our very exciting candidate is. Thank you. Good morning. I'm not even gonna try to follow that by like being super cool somehow because it's just not possible. At the end of your pews, you will find connection cards. These are a way for you to stay connected with all souls during the week, whether you're a first time visitor or a long time member. Let us know of any lay pastoral needs that you might have. Let us know if there are programs you're excited to attend or programs that you don't see yet. One change that I want our longtime congregants to note is that there is now a date field up at the top of the card. This helps us to be a better green sanctuary church by not throwing dated cards in the recycling at the end of each weekend, but it is helpful to us if you fill in that date. I hope that everyone will take the time to read the announcements in their order of service this morning, and thank you very much. Our opening words today are the poem, Wild Geese, by Mary Oliver. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees. For a hundred miles through the desert, desert repenting, you only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about your despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are now, how ma no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination calls you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. Good morning, all souls. If you'll join me in a way that is comfortable to center ourselves for this call to gather, this call to worship, I invite us to take a deep breath. 
Welcome this morning. Welcome to everybody, to your stories, to who you are, to, to what has made you who you are, to all that you bring to this congregation, to all that we have to give to each other, to share with one another. Let's welcome all of that this morning, just as I am welcome, welcoming, not reading from a script for the call to worship. We bring our imperfections, we bring our skills, we bring our families, we bring a lot of things into this space, and it's all welcomed here. So let us worship together this morning and welcome. And we invite Sarah Cannon to lay our chalice for us. With Lydia Leal, yes. Let us all recite the covenant on the wall behind us as Lydia Leal lights our chalice. Love, Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. To dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. This is our covenant. At this time, we will sing hymn number 361. Enter, rejoice, and come in. That hymn always puts me in such a good mood. I love it so much. And I'm excited because it's a new month and we have a new Soul Matters theme. And this month that theme is awakening. But I have to quibble with one thing Soul Matters said in the RE packet this month. They said that awakening is about getting away from TikTok culture to what really matters. Raise your hand if you know what TikTok is. All right, so like at least half of us, that's pretty good. It's, it's an app where you can watch short videos that anybody can make. And sometimes it gets a bad rap because some of the videos are ridiculous or they're rude or they're kind of terrible. But like most things, it can also be a beautiful place. And there's one TikTok that I particularly love. And it's a three-year-old boy who's out for his morning walk. And it sounds like this. I don't know if you can hear that, but he's yelling, hi, hi, good morning, as he's walking down the street. And the thing that I love about this is that you can hear his grown-up laughing in the background, but there's nobody else there. <laughs> this kid has got the spirit of welcome in his soul, and if there is nobody to say good morning to, then he's going to welcome the people who aren't there yet. He's going to do it like it's his job. Now. I really appreciate that about him because sometimes when I'm feeling crabby, I can go and I can watch this TikTok and it really does awaken me to how great it is to welcome 
and to feel welcome. Awakening to the things that are special, the things that matter, is one of our many ways to pray. And like meditation, it can take practice. You can start with things that are nearby and familiar. For example, I might go outside to my chicken coop and collect an egg from my chickens and feel it warm in my hand and look at its beautiful blue or brown color of its shell and welcome that gift of food that feels like a miracle to me. Or I might go and hug Graham, my youngest son, and really pay attention to how nice it is to hug someone and get a hug from someone that I love more than anyone else in the world. So we can even welcome people who live in our house already and are already part of our family. But I can widen that circle. For example, I can look around me, like I'm doing right now, and notice how beautiful all the people are. And I don't mean that they look like movie stars. I mean that you can notice that someone who is passing by has a nice smile. Maybe I see someone walking a dog and I notice that the dog is happy and that it seems to really love and trust that person and that tells me something about the person. Noticing these things makes me feel happy and good about the world. And that's a good way to practice our universalism, which says that all the people around us are special and beloved. So I'm thinking about this today because Emily and Elizabeth and our special guest, Patty, are all being people of awakening today. And they're offering us the chance to do that too. They're talking about the things that really matter, like being a community of communities. Being different groups of people who are all in Indianapolis, who all love and care about each other and share space together. Now, one of the reasons they're talking about this is because we're going to be welcoming some new children and families into our All Souls building. And they're mostly going to be here when we're not, during the week, when maybe you're at school, or maybe you're doing homeschooling at your house, or maybe you're working your job, or maybe you're cleaning your kitchen, or who knows, but you're not usually going to be here. But we can still offer them love and welcome. If we see any preschool families, when we're here, we can smile, and we can wave, and we can take the love and welcome in our souls, and we can almost like beam it out like a superpower. And I bet if we do that, they'll be able to feel it. We can keep making sure that All Souls is a beautiful and tidy and well cared for place because they'll definitely notice that the minute they get here every day. That's what I think. And we can make sure that visitors to or neighbors of All Souls get told early and often how glad we are to have the preschool here. That's a way to keep being welcoming long after the preschool stops being new. Our open hearts are one kind of welcome, and our loving thoughts are another. We can imagine Head Start children safe and happy, coming here to learn and play every day. We can imagine their grown-ups coming to get them and take them home, and how happy they're going to be to see each other and hug each other and go get dinner together. By the way, our fourth principle, the free and responsible search for truth and meaning, is partly about welcome. Learning about and showing respect for the cultures of our friends and neighbors is one way to be welcoming. Did you know that many kids in our preschool will know how to speak two languages, Spanish and English? Raise your hand if you can comfortably, and I mean comfortably, speak two languages. Right, very, very few of us. So that's a good thing for us to awaken to, to our respect for little kids who can do something already that most of the grown-ups in this room can't do. And if you want to challenge yourself to do some of the same kinds of learning that the Head Start kids are doing, we have a whole bunch of new books in our Faith Formation Library that have words in both Spanish and English. We always speak to our friends and neighbors using the language that they prefer, and that may be English, but we can still take the time to learn as a way to show respectful welcome. So, all during the service today and every day, let's remember how to be awake to and how special it is to welcome Head Start to all souls. Hey, hi, good morning.
Well, today is such a meaningful day for me. I think I've shared with many of you that my father's side of the family were migrant farm workers, traveling between Indiana and Texas until they finally settled out in southern Indiana, Columbus, Indiana, in the early 70s. And similar today to today's migrant and seasonal farm worker population, where nearly 30% of the families travel to work in agriculture, they still come here from Texas. Well, he also considered Texas to be his home base. However, when my father was in the seventh grade, his home shifted as my grandpa decided to buy an acre of land just up a mile from the camp where they once worked. On this acre of land, he brought one of the semi-trailer shelters from the camp where they worked. This shelter had once served as their home during the months they spent working in Indiana. In it, however, on this acre of land, this is where my grandpa decided to store his gardening tools that we used regularly to grow an assortment of our own food, green beans, strawberries, tomatoes, peppers. It never failed to astound me the amount of food that we grew with our own hands. Growing up, my father was also pretty active in the writer scene here in Indianapolis. Most of his stories centered around his formative years, his childhood, and the experiences he had navigating a life that sometimes seemed to be something of a paradox. My dad enjoyed life in the camp, and even the work that they did. He always had friends to play with, and he was often surrounded by his extended family. But as you can imagine, being a poor Mexican-American student in rural Indiana in the 60s, it also came with some challenges. I grew up with those stories that I must have listened to or read hundreds of times, picking tomatoes, watering the moon bowls, and my life on Dogwood Street are just a few of his stories from which I learned some important life lessons that continue to guide my own life. And I've always felt a strong connection to this legacy. And so when I was asked today to give a reflection, I eagerly accepted. However, this week, as I shared with Elizabeth, I began to question, oh my gosh, what am I gonna talk about? Because I recalled a video that I saw in February titled, Creating Conditions for Equity in Migrant Education. And it was presented by Dr. Pedro Noguera. And it really, to me, was prophetic. So if you have an opportunity, again, Creating the Conditions for Equity in Migrant Education by Dr. Pedro Noguera. And this presentation was for an audience of migrant directors in California, migrant education directors. And in it, he asks to this staff that works with these families on a regular basis, how much do you really know about the day-to-day -day experiences of the students and families that you work with? What do you really know about their struggles, their joys, their dreams? And I began to wonder if I had made a mistake I had originally hoped to capture a semblance of the migratory farm worker experience and share that with you all, but I began to fear that some important insights might get lost in that translation. And so I feel connections and pride in this family legacy. It's likely that I too still don't know what I don't know. And so I began to worry to the point where I even asked Carmelo if he might be willing to give the reflection today I don't know if you know this, but Carmelo actually did some, some work in, um, in the grape harvest in California. Thought maybe he could come up here and talk to you all, share a little bit about his first time falling in love in the Sonoran vineyards, but he was not so eager. So here I am. <laughs> Luckily, however, that next day I woke up and I remembered two things. One, my congregation is pretty forgiving. Thank you. <laughs> and two, I do also have another lived experience, one that is all my own, that I wanted to share with you all. While I decided to go ahead and include some of those basics about my family's history and how we landed here in Indiana, this too is significant to my identity. I also wanted to share with you all that I was a Head Start student. Due to some special circumstances, I began attending our local Head Start Center at age three. I learned how to do school and my Head Start Center became like a second home to me, one that I eagerly looked forward to attending each day. There I made new friends, I played, I ate yummy meals and snacks, 
I began to learn my letters, my numbers, my shapes, and my colors. The knowledge that I received or was introduced to at that Head Start prepared me well for school. I distinctly remember those first few days of school, actual school, kindergarten. And I say this because it was the first time that I, actually, that I was being tested on what I knew. And, during the, and that was the first week. I had to organize my numbers, zero through 10. They were giving us flashcards and telling us to name, what are these letters, uppers and lowercase, the colors and shapes. And guess which kiddo did really well on all of those assessments? So early on, I was privileged to learn in an environment that was affirming and supportive and where learning felt like play. And in school, this translated to a love for learning, one that allowed me to persevere even when I didn't know all the answers. And school was a place where I generally felt comfortable. Early on, I developed this identity as a pretty smart kid, and that stayed with me, stayed with me throughout my years in education and helped me to foster my own sense of comfort in some of those environments. Recently, through my work in migrant education, I learned last spring that East Coast Migrant Head Start Project was coming to Indiana. I had heard about their philosophy on culturally responsive teaching, their work to integrate the Spanish language and pride heritage throughout the curriculum, and I was so excited to hear that they would be providing services to our migrant families here in Indiana. And although I knew that they were looking for a space in central Indiana, I didn't immediately make the connection to our All Souls home here in Indianapolis. But I wondered, after all, we're pretty close to 465, that's convenient. And so I sent an email to some All Souls staff and included a few of our connections from East Coast Migrant Head Start, thinking it was worth the shot. And after all, here are two wonderful communities doing good work, and at the very least, some good would come from entertaining the idea. And now here we are. And I'm so excited about the future for both of our organizations. I am beyond thrilled that we will be sharing our beautiful space together. I really cannot contain my excitement. All, Sir, All Souls has been our church home for over 10 years now. And to see us work in partnership with the Migrant Head Start, well, as you can imagine, it fills my heart. And so I am so excited for the learning and the growth and the friendships that are going to come with this experience. And I'm looking forward to our journey together. So thank you all souls and welcome to East Coast Migrant Head Start. Thank you, Emily, for that beautiful reflection that connects us even further. If you will rise, if you are able for our hymn number one, two, three. We are going to sing this in English and in Spanish. And before Greg starts playing the English or the hymn, I'm going to have you repeat the Spanish after me. Okay, so just follow my lead. Fuente de amor, ven hacia mí. Fuente de amor, ven hacia mí. Y al corazón, cántale tu compasión. Y al corazón, cántale tu compasión. Sopla al valor, sube en el mar. Sopla al valor, sube en el mar. Hasta moldear la justicia de la vida. Arraigame, libérame. Fuente de amor, ven a mí, ven a mí. So we'll begin with English and then move into Spanish and Greg will lead us.
Thank you. You may be seated. It's really beautiful to see UU congregations uh, do Spanish portions, whether that's in our hymns or in reading our covenants. So I just want to share how meaningful that is to me and to those of us who speak Spanish as well. We share joys and sorrows each Sunday as part of our spiritual practice of community and our covenant to live by the spirit of love. This morning, we continue to hold in our minds and in our hearts all the people in our congregation who are going through tough times. Like Helen Dwyer, who lost her cousin, Tracy Kunkel, on March 21st, and for the loss of her aunt, Josephine Ridgway, who died on March 29th. We hold you in our hearts, and may your loved ones rest in the abundance of loving kindness. And we hold in our hearts the suffering in our own country and across the world. May our suffering end through the healing of the oppressed. May our suffering end so that reciprocation of pain may one day stop. And I want to lift up that March 31st was Trans Day of Vis Visibility. Our denomination affirms the inherent worth and dignity of all trans, non-binary, genderqueer, genderfluid, metagender, or intersex people, and many more targeted by ignorant and hateful laws. Our denomination is one that cares deeply about trans children and youth. And this morning, I invite us all to hold space for our community. I have learned so much from our trans and the larger LGBTQ community about what it means to live authentically and comfortably in our human bodies that are very complex and nuanced. And I've learned that we do not need to have firsthand experience and that we do not need to understand everything to protect the rights of trans people. May their rights be fully given to them. And may we stand with courage and love alongside our trans community with the awareness that their liberation is the liberation of the BIPOC community, the black indigenous people of color, and all. And this morning, I also want to lift up the joys of having Patricia Patti here, our center director, and to be up here with Emily Salinas and to have worked with Sarah Cannon and for Greg and for all the people who've been a part of creating this service today. Thank you, Nasreen, and everybody involved. And I want to lift up the joy that is being celebrated throughout our city and the world by Muslims for the next 30 days a time of personal sacrifice and commitment to generosity. You don't have to be Muslim to welcome Ramadan, the holy month with other people. As we say in Arabic to welcome this month, Ramadan Mubarak, blessed Ramadan to Muslims. May we welcome the abundance of love, generosity, and healing pouring forth from this holy month to which we too are connected. This morning again, I'd like to invite us to take a few deep breaths together. And I invite you to close your eyes if that's helpful to ground you, just to take a moment to disconnect from everything as much as we are able. And maybe as you're taking those deep breaths, and closing your eyes. You're grounding your feet into the ground of our church. And you can feel how safe you are here in community with all. May we know the root of happiness. May our beloved friends, lovers, partners, pets, families, our children be happy. May our neighbors and colleagues be happy. May those we are in conflict with on any level 
be happy. May we all be happy. May it be so. Amen. This morning, our offertory contributions will go to our very own East Coast Migrant Head Start Project, Indianapolis Campus. Your contributions today will support the Head Start Project to provide the supplies and the educational toys that will help children receive a high quality education to support school readiness. The children of migrant and seasonal farm workers are cared for and advocated for in a culturally sensitive way and so are their parents who matter the most to these children. To contribute, you can put cash or check into the collection plate, or online, you can go to allsoulsindy.org, where you will find a link that says Give to All Souls here. On the left side, beneath the description for today's service, be sure to mention that your donation is for the Head Start Project. Thank you for your generosity in supporting the mission of all souls and for your continued love for one another and for this world. May we now accept our morning offering. Thank you for your gifts towards the Head Start School this morning. I want to welcome our guest, Patricia Licea. Patricia goes by Patti. We're really happy to have her here. So she is the Indianapolis campus that we'll be hosting here. She's the campus director, and she'll be sharing a few things about her connection with the Head Start School for us. Welcome. I want to say good morning to everybody and thank you for the opportunity for being here with you all. And I just want to share a little bit of me being part of East Coast. As you mentioned, my name is Patricia Licea. I am the campus director here for Indianapolis East Coast Migrant Head Start. East Coast is new here in Indiana. 
but it's not new like in the world. They have been serving for more than 40 years in 11 states, and now they have 48 campuses where we provide services for children and their families, migrant and seasonal workers. I wanted to share a little bit about my program. We are not a daycare. Our commitment is to provide high quality, early education, among other services for our children. We serve kids essentially meals like breakfast, lunch, and snack. We prepare them for kindergarten and for public school. We also, make, we also help them learn to be independent and to socialize with other children so we can prepare them as I mentioned before. And then we, they learn through play. They learn because we have different areas. The centers are there with the educational. We have our teachers that prepare their lesson plans among their needs. We have screenings that they determine what are the needs for each children. We also help the parents, helping them with um, with appointments, if they need to set up appointments with doctors, with dental, if they need any referrals, that they're in need for some needs. Because when they, when they come over here, they left everything back home in Texas or Florida, wherever they come from. So they come over here, if they need help, we want to be prepared for them to have resources where refer them to go get the help they need. This is, this is my second season with East Coast but I've been working for Head Start for over 30 years. I, I started working very young. Everything that started when in Texas, I was a, a migrant worker myself. I married very young, so my husband's grandparent, he used to go to Texas and work over there in the fields. And I thought, oh, that's an easy job, I can do it. I was so wrong. <laughs> I worked for one week and they would have to be picking peppers and I said, oh, that's easy money because I thought it was going to be easy to pick up. In one week, I only picked $25. So and I ended up going to the doctor's where they spent more money than, than me picking up, because I thought it was an easy job. I see everybody going like super quick. I said, oh, I can do, probably I can do 100 a hundred per day. That, that was my thought back then, but I was so wrong. That was very hard to do it. But I continue working as a migrant worker in, in Tahoka. The, I have two children back then, and I will take them to the, to the fields with me. I didn't want to put them in a, in a, in any, under anybody because I, I didn't know anybody there in that community. So then I started seeing this bus. It was called Texas Migrant um, Council. And I said, what is that? And I saw they were dropping children. And, stuff, and I started asking the workers there, what is it? They started you know, introducing me to the program. But it was new to me, Hester, what is that? You know? And back then, I didn't know, like, we can use the Google and Google everything. So I started asking questions, and I always fear of water and height. So my kids had to go like, it was not a big river, it was just like a pond, but to me it was like an immense river. So I didn't want to let my kids go over there, but then I understand they were getting a benefit to be in Head Start. So they were having, you know, hot meals, they were not to be exposed to the dirt, the sun and everything, so from there, once I went back to Texas, I looked for that program, and they continue on their education and head start before going to school. So I think the children benefit from our program. And I start, like I said, then I moved with that, with, I start working with that company. I didn't have no education because I was very, very young, so I dropped out of school. But then I started working as a cook Then I got the opportunity to go back to school. I got my GED. Then I went back to college. I get my associate. And now with East Coast, I have to go back to get my bachelor's. So I think we're getting something, not only the children, the families, but ourselves as workers, we have the benefit for working with these organizations. And like I mentioned at first, I was very feared to become a center director because of the responsibility of having all those children over my children. And every day I still have fears that something might happen to them. So every morning I pray to God to give me the strength and to be wise, you know, and to give me that knowledge to go day by day. I don't think what's gonna happen like in a month. I just go day by day, because, you know, I wanna provide not only me, but my staff where I will come along, always to provide good services, because these families need our help. They need, they need to go work and be all comfortable. Oh, my children taking good care of them. Because, you know, they take taking to babysitters and we don't know what happened to them, if they eat or they don't eat. So we'll be sure that they are fed 
and they're very, you know, when they go home, if their babies, they drive, we fed them before going, and, because we don't know if that babysitter is gonna provide, because we don't know, actually. We're just hoping and pray that our children could take care of their and other kids. And I just wanna share that I'm excited to be part here of, it, of All Souls. And the first person I met, it was Sarah, and I was very happy. And then I met Joe Elizabeth, and now I just met Emily, which is the one that connects us over here. And I'm thankful, and I'm here, and I hope um, everybody can have us not only here, but in your hearts. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you for that. We are really glad that you're here with us and that you shared your connections, because again, it brings it home. So I'm really grateful that we got to hear Bati's stories this morning and her connection to Head Start. And I want to thank Emily for the stories that she also shared with us to bring it home even more and to thank her for connecting all souls to East Coast Migrant Head Start Project. I'm grateful to be here for this moment with you all. At one time or another, when we think about entering into new relationships, we wonder about a lot of things. We get curious because there is a lot of unknown that comes with a new relationship. And it's normal to be curious about what's coming up or if we will be a good fit, about what we might offer a new relationship and partnership, and what this might mean for the life that we had before. How will we grow? How will we be ourselves? And it's a big deal to have gone through COVID as we have and to be returning back to a new type of normal with part of our church being shared, with more children who come from so many places with so many different stories. And we have the Freedom School. We get to experience our children in the services now. And our children are getting acclimated to being around everyone, and they're learning to make it through sermons. <laughs> and now we get to host children who travel the country. It's incredible to have children in our churches. Last week, we had the opportunity to learn more about farm worker history and the importance of shifting our language to be strengths-based and language that leans into our first principle, that all are inherently worthy and filled with dignity. That service was important for today because it meant to humanize our very families entering our building this summer. It meant to speak about the parents of these children through a lens that honors them as people and that values the craft that they do of putting food on our tables, especially with the narrative that goes around that they're stealing jobs, leading to discrimination, sowing division, if you have not listened to last Sunday's service, I invite you to please listen. It's on our website, and it will provide valuable history. Today's service, though, is about deepening our welcome together in community and deepening our welcome of the children of these hardworking and skilled migrant and seasonal farm workers, deepening our welcome of the parents and the staff that this program will host. And I'm relieved this morning because this welcome is going to be much easier than we think. And this is why I love Mary Oliver's poem, Wild Geese. It's so important in talking about how to be prepared to welcome. Mary Oliver opens up her poem with these lines. You do not have to be good. 
You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Again, you do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Her beautiful words are here to remind us that we just need to love. And we can breathe and relax about this new relationship and partnership. We can welcome this new partnership fully with all of its people side by side, loving and supporting them. We just need to trust in the good work of the East Coast Migrant Head Start Project. So I want to begin by sharing why this program matters so much. And we've heard some of these reasons. And why we're lucky to be the host of it for Indianapolis. The Head Start School is a critical part of the justice work for migrant and seasonal farm worker families. A program like this gives stability to parents to know that their children are safe and being cared for holistically. A program like this provides opportunities to things unknown to our farm workers. Opportunities that make it possible, for example, for these youth to graduate from high school and go to college or trade school. Because only 55% of children of farm workers graduate from high school. The lack of stability, the constant going to and from, the lack of awareness of resources available also due to language barriers, and getting caught up working in the fields as children too. All of these things make it hard to even graduate from high school. A mother who now has children in the program in a different state said about the program the following. Before East Coast was built, we used to leave our children with different people. We didn't know if people would feed them or change them or take care of them. When the center was built, we knew they were in good hands, that they are well taken care of, that they're feeding them breakfast, lunch, and a snack. They're learning. They're not just in a room watching TV. In East Coast, they're learning their letters, their colors and stuff. Without programs like these, Children would end up in unstable places and sometimes in the fields being exposed to chemicals and heat. And many children start working in the fields at the age of six years old. Our laws allow this, but this program protects their childhood and grants them stability every year, allowing them to learn English so that they aren't behind in kindergarten as English learners. And this is why the staff of the East Coast Mi Migrant Head Start Project is so important. We get to share space to bring forth stability, advocacy, to provide quality education, nutritional foods, play, nature time, outdoor time, lots of love. And it's so important to see our children and their parents with love and respect. Last Sunday, I shared that we grow up as children proud to witness the hard work that our parents do, but the system crushes us and our self-image by sending confusing messages about us and our parents. We grow up comparing our parents at some point or another with those with more money, better cars, and bigger houses. <clears throat> Comparison as the emotion. If you've watched the new Brene Brown Atlas of the Heart show on HBO Max, comparison is core to us. We're either comparing up or we're comparing down. They're better than me. I'm better than them. 
So it's hard on children to understand why their parents are so busy working and why they still struggle so much. And it's imperative that with that same love and compassion that we witness the youth, that we witness those most important to them, their parents. And the work of compassion takes the skill of empathy. And the skill of empathy requires us to listen to other stories. And although we cannot walk in someone else's shoes, we can connect to the emotion that they're experiencing too. And we all know how much it sucks to compare ourselves to others. So I want us to now talk about what all souls can expect with this new relationship. With the urge to be back in the building, missing the church spaces that is home to us, it makes sense that you might be curious about the space downstairs. And so together with East Coast, we will be providing tours available at the end of April through the beginning of May. Look for information about that in the newsletter in the know. This will allow you, as the congregation, to get to witness the space and how it's been beautifully transformed before it is occupied and treated with the same respect as any other school where people have to check in at the main office and go through the East Coast entrance door. For those who might not be able to make the tours, we will provide a photo album to show pictures of how the space has changed. The school will begin by July 18th, although this could be as early as mid-June, and it will end in October. Staff are expected to arrive in May. And now let's talk about trust, because this will be an essential part of our welcome. Where trust begins in this relationship is actually with our farm worker parents. Parents who are joining this program are the ones entrusting program, this East Coast Migrant Head Start project with their children. And this Indianapolis campus will be building a relationship of trust with the parents and the kids. And they will be assisting them in the ways that Patricia shared with us. They will work to make sure parents get their needs met, housing, clothes, health care. And they're going to work to build partnerships in the city to connect families to other resources. You to trust that this is like any normal school. Parents will come in and out of the Head Start entrance door throughout the week, and they will be in our building once a month in the evenings in the social hall. They will be fed a warm meal after a hard day's work. And they will be engaging in parent meetings where, where they will be supported to be able to reinforce the good work with their children. You will find this schedule at some point on our website. And this is important to know because we want these parents to feel welcomed, respected, and to never be looked at through the lens that diminishes them and blames them for systemic issues. If we have work to do in this area, that's okay. But just know that the work of dealing with our internal biases and stereotypes is our own to do. And we can do that with the help of our church. Again, last week's sermon gives important historical understanding. And we are invited to trust that the Head Start School knows best what they need. The Head Start project is accountable to the federal government with policies and procedures. Again, serving in 11 states under a $70 million budget. This is a program that has been doing this for some time and in many places, and they know what they're doing, who they're serving, and what best they do. Listening. This relationship will be much easier because it just requires us to listen to the needs the school has. Through listening, we will know exactly where we may be able to support them as a congregation. We don't have to be anyone but ourselves in this relationship. And this makes the partnership that much easier because we're entrusting them that they, not us, know what they need. 
We have invited them to let us know about the opportunities that exist for our congregation to assist if they can. And we will share that through newsletters and announcements. Sharing our space. I mentioned that there is a designated door for entry on the far left side of our church. That is where children, parents, staff, and volunteers will enter through. The hallway to the left of our main entrance with the stairs that go downstairs will be unavailable except for maintenance reasons for the school and the church. And expect signage that will go up to be very clear about these things. One of the things that East Coast does is they lead a community assessment. They assess demographics, preschools in the area, how many farms and growers are around here within a 50 mile radius, and they will assess how programs and social services, what social programs are, are available. They are leading through service and connecting the good work happening near us. But what other kind of support can all souls offer them? Well, we can begin by sharing the staff positions available with anyone we might know. They're currently working to fill staff positions that include teachers and teachers assistants, center bus caregivers and bus drivers, and there's some really great incentives offered. You will find this information on your way out at the welcome table if you know anyone that might appreciate knowing about these opportunities. And we can also connect the Head Start project with doctors, dentists, nurses who will help these families. If you have any co connections, please talk to me after the service or stay on the lookout for something in the newsletter. And finally, what about volunteers? The school will need volunteers and this can come from our congregation. They will need volunteers to read books to children to lead art, lead art activities, just an extra set of hands. Expect a background check, of course, if you're helping out regularly in a TB test. There might be opportunities even to hold the babies. When I heard this, I thought it was an incredible opportunity, especially after what we've all been through with COVID. I know so many of us love working with our children, and this is an opportunity to serve. And I want to share with you that I too learned a lot about Welcome through the work of preparing for these services. I learned a lot through the conversations that have been had over the months with staff here, with your board that is so excited to welcome this partnership. And most importantly, with the East Coast Migrant Head Start Project staff that is glad to have a home here. And I, too, have learned to trust more and listen better. Throughout this process, I began to feel very aware of things I've known my whole life as the daughter of brown parents and a laborer who has worked in the field, too. I have tried to protect my parents from uncomfortable spaces where I, myself, with my own light skin, have felt unwelcomed. So I want to invite you, all souls, into this amazing opportunity through this relationship to just be yourselves. I think sometimes in the work of our denomination, people try really hard to show up, but what it often takes is just trust and listening. It's through that where we will find the opportunities to help if we're needed. Otherwise, we can just continue coming to church like any other day and let the people next to us do the good work. And I'll end with this. We're profoundly interconnected as we've witnessed in our conversations about farm workers and now in the welcoming of our new families. And I invite us to lean into, into principle one of the inherent worth and dignity of all and to principle seven respecting the interdependent web of all things. And I invite us to celebrate how lucky we get to be to host East Coast here. Congratulations, all souls, for receiving this opportunity. If you will join me now in our closing hymn, number 407, we're going to sit at the welcome table.
with gratitude to you all for being here this morning, with gratitude for all that connects us. I am just so happy that we're here together. May we all go in peace. And may our relationships start off with us just being ourselves. May it be so. Amen. by Ollie Howe after the postlude finishes and that link is in your welcome email sent out about 9.30 this morning. Thank you all for being here with us this morning.